Hey, welcome to the Insurance Buzz. This is your host, Michael and Courtney Weaver. We have a special guest with us today, the owner of Ideal Traits, Mr. Kevin Milnerick. Kevin, how are you? I'm doing real, real well. How about you guys? Doing so good. We're good. We were talking about polar plunging before uh, we hit record because yeah. you are also on a lake and it was also very chilly where you are. So we're excited to chat. But I haven't done a polar plunge. I don't know. I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> so do one and tag me when you do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> oh, shoot. No, well, Kevin, I, I'd love to hear because you have a you have an extensive resume. You, you've, you've owned agencies. Obviously, you have a recruiting firm. Would love to know just a little bit about you and how you got in, really started in the insurance world. Yeah. So um, it, I guess it started, I mean, out of college, I actually planned on going to law school. And in the meantime, I was looking around and I kind of looked at my car and it was pretty dirty and dingy. I was like, well, I kind of like to drive a new car. So how can I get a new car? Well, I'll go work at a car dealership. So um, at the car dealership, I went in and I interviewed for the first first dealership and they said, you can't sell. You're too young. You've never done this before. No. I'm like, okay, well, I'm pretty persistent. Let's go to the next one. Same thing. The third one, the same thing. Um, but the fourth one said, hey, here's an application and an assessment. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay. So I fill out the assessment, fill out the application. And then Bill Hahn Jr., the owner of the dealership, said, all right, come on in for an interview. I'm sitting there with four guys much older than me and more experienced in sales for sure. And one of the first things they say is, well, it looks like you can sell based on your assessment. And here I'm going, well, I knew that for sure. <laughs> and in reality, I, I, I mean, I felt I could. Uh, long story short, started there and, you know, worked there for 13 years. After six months, I didn't go to law school. I got a promotion. And then I went to special finance and then finance and sales manager, general sales manager, and, and on and on. And what changed is when my son was born in December 31st of 2005. And so when he was born, I knew that I didn't want to do the same hour. So I was searching for a career and I was kind of down to either a stockbroker or insurance. I had this gal that used to come into the dealership and sell insurance, an all-state agent, and she said, you'd be great. I was like, all right, well, you know, hey, I'll talk to your manager, whoever, hiring person. And and that's when it really just kind of started. I got my license while I was still working and ended the dealership in December of 06. And then March of 07, we opened up our first Allstate agency with no experience, with no mentor. I mean, I really didn't know anybody other than Deborah. No one... Um, Maybe some would say no business opening up an agency, but, you know, I feel like I, you know, I was ending the dealership with running a sales team. So that's how I knew how to build a sales team. That was my plan. And, and of course, I, when I started the dealership and started hiring, the owner would say, every single person has to take an assessment. The porter, the body shop guy, you know, all of it. I mean, it was the only way. And by doing that, that just instilled in me and in how I was going to hire in the future and for my agency. So that's where I started in, um, in 07, March of 07. I had one employee. And then, you know, it's like, well, if one employee is good, then, you know, two would be better. And if two is good, then three and three, then four. And then if one agency is good, why not two? And then three and then four and then five. So we opened up agencies in 07, 08, 09. 11 and 14 and those were all scratch agencies with all state mm, i so. love that that is incredible and it's such a <clears throat> shift too to go from the car world which is very long hours very intense there's a lot going yeah. on to transition to insurance did it quickly become with five agencies mm-hmm. was it that much time as it was before or how did you manage all five of those like let's start there yeah well and it started with you know putting great people in place so i wouldn't deploy another agency until i had that key person 
and a key person could come from one of the other agencies or um, I happen to have, you know, a couple of people. I pulled one from the dealership, one of my sales managers and told him, hey, this is a great business. You should get started in it, too, and started him off um, as the manager. And so that helped out a lot. Um, but the transition was, I would say, fairly easy and so thankful and appreciative to the the my owner and the, the mentors that I had in the dealership. Because like um, insurance sales, it's very price driven. Like everyone wants to get a good deal, right? A lot of negotiating going on. And by that, we had to sell on value. And so it was never about price. And so I had that going into the insurance. Now, the cool thing about insurance that I loved is that there was no negotiating. I mean, it is what it is. You can change your coverage and that'll bring your price up and down. However, the price is the price. Mm-hmm. And no one's asking me to lower the price. And that felt weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then we also had, I had, and I instilled in my team, the sense of urgency. And so I think that people generally want to do business with us, um, but they like to kick the can. Is just this natural response of, well, let me think about it. Mm-hmm. And as they think about it, they're really not going to think about it again. Ever. They just go home and it just feels like the right thing to say is, I just want to think about it. And it's like, well, I mean, let us help you think through it now while I can answer the questions. What questions would you have? And so ultimately, just creating that sense of urgency of signing up now, because in the car business, it was like, there's no such thing as the be back bus. It's one way. And it goes away from the dealership and it never comes back. Mm-hmm. And when we have that sense and that thought of that, then you place more urgency into it and we're able to close more sales, have a higher close ratio. And, um, you know, it really worked out well. So we grew it to about 20 million in organic premium in eight years. And it was just all due to having great staff. I mean, you, we can't do it on our own. Yeah. So that's a uh, <clears throat> sense of urgency is always something that gets brought up. Um, a lot of agency owners are like, how do you instill a sense of urgency. So I'd love for you to talk a little, I mean, obviously asking for the sell multiple times, just like the think about it. Like, hey, the reason they need to think about it is because they don't have enough information to make a buying decision or they're afraid of buyer's remorse or they're afraid to tell you no. So <laughs> which one Which one is it? But how, if, if there's an agency owner out there listening right now and they're like, man, I just, my team just does not have that sense of urgency that maybe I have. How would you, how would you go about being like, hey, try this? Yeah. So, um, you know, one thing that we did in the agency is I mean, we had a meeting every single day. So we'd open at nine, but eight thirty to nine every day was training. I mean, if it ended in why we trained mm-hmm. and we started with really, you know, instilling in them the assumptive close, which is so obvious, but so important to just constantly remind them during the sale, you know, when we get your new policy in place, you know, in your new coverage. And so using all of these terms that get them accustomed to this being automatic. And the, the thought that I would have and I would talk to my, my staff in is, you know, imagine, and, you know, we'd ask the people, OK, so who are you with? And they say State Farm, AAA, Liberty Mutual, you know, whatever. And we'd be like, State Farm, really State Farm? We are super competitive against State Farm. I'm so glad you called today. (laughs) And I wanted them to think about what if the last 100 deals that you had against Liberty Mutual, you closed. And it's just like, oh my gosh, how would you sound on that phone call? And you would be so confident and you'd be so assumptive, like, I, I mean, I just can't wait to get to the end because I know it's just going to be an automatic. And so it's hard to do because in our business, the close ratio is certainly less than half. And in Michigan, we actually had a 5% was our average close ratio. So, but it's like that mind of thinking that I just closed 100 Liberty Mutual and you're with Liberty Mutual. That's awesome. That's perfect. And, you know, so really concentrate on using the words of ownership and assumptiveness 
and then getting to the end. And I don't think you need to ask them, would you like to buy today? You don't need to do that. Just ask them two questions and you that you win both ways. And again, this isn't magic here, but it's like, you know, would you like to use, put the down payment on your credit card or write a check or, you know, <laughs> debit card and just two positive options that either way lead down to the same path of, of uh, signing up. Yep. <clears throat> I love that. I actually don't believe that when you're like, hey, so what do you like? You want to buy today? I actually don't think that's asking for the sell. I think asking for the sell is what you just said. Like you putting this on a Visa, MasterCard, American Express. Like, yeah. how are we, how are we doing this today? Like, <laughs> right. um, no, I love that. <laughs> this is my, like, I, I just, know, I just got here. done doing a closing techniques training. So I'm like, this is great. Like transfer of enthusiasm. <laughs> like, this is awesome. Yeah. So you have agencies and you recently just sold your last one. So Ideal Traits, tell me when Ideal Traits was born. When did that come about? And what is that? <laughs> Yeah, so um, in 2010 and 11, I did a lot of speaking across the country for Allstate, um, you know, based on our results. And we, we ended up top in the country twice. And so they'd have me speaking. And, you know, I talked about, like, I can't do it in a month. You have to have great staff. And then they'd be like, how do you get great staff? And I'm like, well, you, you have to do an assessment. And they were like, what? What's that? You know, and nobody was using assessments at all. And it's like, I mean, yeah, it's super important to know who you're hiring. And especially, you know, if you hire the wrong person, how much money is it? It's crazy the amount of money that people will risk because they get emotionally attached to somebody that they want to simply just fill the chair with. Like, I need somebody. And so they get all emotional about it. And, you know, they ask them questions like, all right, um, will you show up on time? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, yes. Right. The easy, these softball questions that make them feel good. And then even if they say, do you like to tell a mark? And I go, eh, yeah, kind of. And they're like, okay, good. Hired. Right. And then you get down the road and you know, in your gut, like it's not going to happen. You feel good temporarily because you fill the chair, but ultimately it doesn't work out. You're 90 days in, you're $12,000 in, not to mention our time of training and, you know, they could be cancerous and it just creates for a bad situation. So by testing, it helps to eliminate those and it finds the right people so that you have the ingredients to be a great salesperson. So I kind of look at it as like, you know, uh, someone that does pottery, which I don't, but if you're going to make a vase, you know, they have the right ingredients on the vase, they can form it and make beautiful artwork out of it. But if you have too much water, if you have too much sand, I mean, it's not going to work. It won't spin. You can't form it. So when we have the right ingredients in place, regardless if they've sold before, just like I didn't sell before, before I worked the dealership, I mean, you still have that ability to train them the way you want to. And for me, I would, it was a negative if you currently sold an insurance. Like I chose not to. You know, it seemed like it would just take twice as long to retrain somebody as train them. And they feel like they had it all figured out. So. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to overcome uh, <clears throat> bad habits. So, yeah. um, so you, you're a recruiting company and you also provide the assessments. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, so we're, we have a recruiting software is what it is. Okay. So we're not a recruiting company in a sense of, outbound we're going to you know look through resumes and find the right person what we do with our software is we help make them the professional recruiter by giving them recruiting software um, and so what that does ultimately is they can create a job ad and these job ads are point and click where you can generate one so we've got all the information there specific to insurance that's all we do and so they can create their opening and then they can create their description and then the uh, the benefits of working at the agency, the roles, the responsibilities, and then they just choose where they'd like to post it. So they can post it up to 100 job boards. Now, the reality is there's only a few of them they're going to aggregate down. I mean, like Indeed and Glassdoor and, you know, are the biggest. Um, so that way they get the job ad out to to cast this large net. 
And then once people apply to those, then they're invited to take the assessment. And then that's where you can really help to determine if they'd be a good fit to take to the next step to do the interview. So when you're looking at this assessment, and I'm curious, are there different types? So there's one assessment and there's four parts. It'll okay. upload the resume, then does a personality profile assessment, and then there's a problem solving, and then there's short answer question. So they all take the same, and then there's 16 different results. And then the results will have, we, you know, we've got our four favorite for sales and our four favorite for a service. And then others, um, you know, depending on what type of role that they're looking for. But then other people, they're not bad. They're just, it's just not a good fit. Mm-hmm. And if it's not a good fit, then they are not enjoying the position and we're probably not enjoying their results as well. So what kind of personalities all right if somebody didn't have an assessment that an agency owner is out there is like i just want to do this myself want to what type of personalities do you see that are most successful that agents or business owners should be looking at when hiring a sales professional yeah so obviously i mean outgoing you know is a, a great attribute for them to have somebody who's persuasive somebody's got a lot of motivation And these are the things that most people, when applying for sales, they're going to tell you that they have. And that's what the assessment does is really identify on a scale of one to 100, like what level are they? And so we look at even deeper than it's actually a three dimension. So we'll look at how they think they are. So it's like, who do I think I am? And then it's how will I react under pressure? So when the phone rings and I'm talking to the client, how am I going to react? And then the last one is how I think other people, how do you, I think you view me. And so you take those three combined, we give you the scores of all of them. And ultimately the one under pressure is the one most that you're going to be obviously on the job. So if someone goes, yeah, you know, I just want to think about it. What are they going to do? What's their natural reaction? But it also will show us consistencies within the test, too. So the more solid the numbers are across, so we'll take motivation and drive. You know, if somebody's an an 85, I think I'm an 85, under pressure, 87, and I think other people think I'm an 84. Like, that's solid. Like, I've got my motivation and drive. And I believe other people can see that as well. So it's a great way to further identify, you know, their real strengths. And there's no, there's no, like, nobody can get 100% on all four categories. They're really selecting what their go-to are. What are their top of four categories? Motivation drive, persuasive convincing, structure routine, and thorough and compliant. Mm -hmm. So to what degree is my favorite of the four? What's my go-to number one? My go-to number two? My third? And then the fourth is... It doesn't mean I'm bad at number four. We'll call that structure routine, which if you looked at my desk, you might say that I am a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> which is what most salespeople, right? They're not the most neat and tidy. It doesn't mean I can't do it. it I would just go rather sell something else. You know what I mean? I just like that part of it. So that's what we measure. And I think that it's great because you you bring it up that it's not that you can't do it. I think it sets it up to where it's easier to know what's their default. Like, right, exactly. What, what would they prefer to do? Because you can train to that. So, when talking about hiring, what are you seeing in the hiring space right now from insurance agents? Like, what do they need to be looking for, or what do they need to be asking? past this assessment. So let's say they take ideal traits, they come up as like, you know, high motivation and drive. How are they sharing, you know, the expectations and the opportunity in a way that sets them up for success past this assessment? Yeah, no, that's really good. And I think um, the industry itself is so aged and, you know, we're trying to bring in a new wave and a new generation of people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are going to be retiring and it's creating an environment 
that's going to be attractive to this younger generation. And too many times they think that, you know, it's, and it sounds like even in their ad, that it's this old dusty place that, you know, is still working by pen and paper. And in reality, the new generation, they want to know that they're making a difference. They want to know that they can be a part of a team and be a part of a winning team. And so those are some of the things that you really want to put in the job ad is that you're a winning environment. These are the awards we won. We have fun at our agency. You know, we volunteer. Volunteer is one of the best things that I ever did in my agency. We would do it every quarter. We'd pick an event and we'd have our staff choose which one, you know, kind of rotate around. And it was such a great way to build that team together. During work hours, they'd still be getting paid. I'd pay them to do it. And you can see that generating and making a difference in the community. And then I'm just one of them. I, you know, I'm just no longer boss employee type relationship. So expressing those things that you do in your agency to be able to attract uh, a, a better and a bigger and a better talent pool, I think is really important. And, and the benefits, you know, people fail to realize that nine to five is unbelievable hours compared to what some are working. Weekends off, if that's what you offer. Um, holidays, a flexible schedule, some work from home potentially, which is a whole other category nowadays. Um, so being able to list all of the benefits and to let them know that you're an organization that doesn't, isn't going to stay stagnant, that you want to grow and thrive and be a part of a winning team. And, you know, another thing we would do, we would have breakfast once a week with our team. So it's just a little, you know, we didn't have a, a, even a full kitchen at the office, but just the, you know, the stove and the, the hot plate with the, the pan and, and cooked eggs. It was just together. Mm-hmm. And I think people want to be part of that environment. That was important. And I love that you're talking about that because I think, I don't think, I believe that not only is that amazing to absolutely have a culture like that, put it on a job description, but also make sure that you are showing this in your community. You're showing this to the public through through social media platforms because that's the number one way to recruit talent. What you just said, people want to have fun and they want to be part of a winning culture. The only way to show that is to actually show it. Let people follow you on your journey. Yeah, I know. I, I totally agree. I would say if there's an area that we could have done better, it would have been that. Because even the things that we did do, we didn't do enough of that. And I would, you're totally right. Like you, you've got a great social media presence and that's just something that I need to learn from you guys from for sure. (laughs) No, no, thank you. So I guess my next question, and this is more of just interest. Like how did you go about creating something like this? Oh, with ideal traits. So we used the the core of what I used in the dealership because I knew it so well inside and out. And then we just got the rights to it. And then we were able to make it specific to insurance. Um, So it was a long process, about 18 months. And then at that point, we were only an assessment company. That's all we had. Um, And it was wildly successful. Our first event you know, we sold 50 clients out of, you know, 100 people in the audience. And so we are 50% close ratio. It's like, yeah, I think we've got something here. <laughs> work. And then we just continue to, we have the same development team as we did in 2012, with the exception of adding. And, and we've got four developers right now that literally work on it every single day. There's constantly has been doing. Uh, changes that we do. We did a complete, you know, user interface uh, changeover this year. We've got new products on the horizon that are nearly completed, which is so much fun. Uh, you know, and then we, we built on the whole advertising piece to it. So it's it's been awesome and we, we don't stop. And that's really where my brother works on the entire website, the design, the functionality of it. He creates that and what it should look like and then, you know, the programmers just work in sync behind the, behind the scenes to make it work. 
I think that is absolutely incredible. And I'm fascinated because you brought up hiring in this landscape from a remote work standpoint, because you said that's something that a lot of people are, you know, looking at right now. So does your assessment, is it catered to what it looks like now about, you know, being able to hire and put somebody in a remote position as well and being able to know if they're going to thrive in a remote position or yeah. if there's somebody that should be in the office? Because I think there's still some flex there mm -hmm. of maybe I have two remote people or maybe I'm I'm working towards that. So I'd be curious if if your assessment can share what best environment they thrive in too. Yeah, no, great question there. And so it will it will give you three to four paragraphs about the description of their environment, their strengths that they have, their weaknesses, and those are things that will kind of help determine if they can. I think for remote in the beginning, you know, a year and a half ago, which is still new, um, people thought that, yeah, it'd be great, you know, working remote. And then they realized that it might not be best for them. Um, so I think that a lot of people do have a pretty good sense that if they would work well at home or not, um, and, you know, whether they're applying for it. Um, there are agencies that say, you know, hey, I would never do remote. And so one of the questions I ask them is, well, do you have every single person in your office that works there every day? And typically what I find is, well, you know, John or Sally, I mean, they live around the corner and they come in on Tuesday and Thursday. And it's like, well, you're already experiencing remote right now. Mm -hmm. You feel comfortable and safe because you know them and they're around the corner. But reality is they're not in the office. Okay. And some people for sure do better remote. I mean, they're, they work harder. And then other people, it doesn't, it doesn't work out. You know, they don't have what it takes to stay on task. And the assessment will bring that out mm -hmm. by looking at their motivation and drive. If they've got low motivation and drive, I mean, that person needs to be in the office. And that's more of a customer service type employee. And so you can pull out those uh, advantages and disadvantages based on their assessment. I love that. I would say even maybe an outgoing person may thrive in an, in an office environment versus maybe like a an extroverted introvert that may do well in a in a home and environment. Yeah. So right. it, it's just remote work. Um, I I don't know. It's uh, I saw a statistic the other uh, a study actually, and it was on LinkedIn, and it had like over twenty thousand votes on it, and seventy six percent of people voted that they want to work remotely for their work environment. And that, that statistic yeah. just blew me away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, if you think about it too, salespeople like us, we want to be around people. And the reality is like 18% of the population are good at sales, let's just say. So the rest, you know, they're not as sociable as, you know, salespeople, generally speaking. Um, so it lines up a little bit with that. And I, I think there is a, a draw to remote because now they're thinking, I mean, shoot, I can go on vacation and still work. I can do more me is really ultimately what it comes down to. They get to, um, you know, be able to control their day and not feel like, so maybe somebody's looking over their shoulder or something. Yeah, if they can work from, you know, 7 a.m. to noon and get more done than 9 to 5 yeah. or whatever that position entails. So I always like to know what pitfalls or mistakes that you're seeing insurance agents making from a hiring perspective. What is something that you're like, oh, please correct yeah. this or change this to make your life so much easier? Yeah. Man, you guys got good questions. I didn't say that's another good one. <laughs> I just want to know what not to do because then it gives yeah. me more of a framework. Yeah, all right. So the number one would be always be hiring. So even when you're not hiring, to always be hired. So you're not in this panic mode and you and revert to the emotional level of hiring. Keep it logical. Like being able to hire when you want to hire and when you find a great person and being able to, you know, put them into place. So that's just a big one that is always, you know, putting their 
their fire engine hat on. It's like, oh my gosh, an emergency. Like we need to hire right now. Mm -hmm. Somebody just left. Well, somebody's going to leave you probably next year, you know, and depending on the size staff, if you've got 10 or more, maybe two are going to leave you. Be prepared. And it's less expensive and less stressful. And I say less expensive because you may be able to pick somebody up without advertising your job ad. So we can, with Ideal Trades, you can put your job ad out there and put it out organically. Now, you don't get nearly the amount of views or hits on it, but it's out there and somebody could stumble upon it. If you're in an emergency hire, now you're shelling out $1,000, $2,000 promoting the job ad and it costs you more and it becomes more stressful. So always be hiring is something that is like so important to do. And then, you know, the other one, major one, is choosing not to hire. They think that hiring is expensive. And hiring is not expensive. Hiring is a growth initiative. It allows you to grow your agency. How could I grow to 20 million by myself? It's so ridiculous to even consider the thought of being able to do that. You grow through people. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm building right now actually a calculator. I've got it in Excel form, but how it'll identify when, when an agent puts in, they say, okay, if I hired a new person, 25 items, what's the average premium? What's the commission? What's the renewal commission? And run that tape out. You know, what do I get paid on bonus? And the numbers are, are staggering. So I was speaking in front of, um, American Family Insurance Agency, about 150 last week, not last week, the week before in Missouri, running the tape on their numbers, eight years, and it was a million dollars in revenue, a million. Too many times agents will look and they're like, all right, I get paid 15%, right? I can't pay 16. I only get paid 15. You get paid nine times. <laughs> Nine years, you're going to get paid, right? At 90% commission, nine times. So they're looking in front of them and behind them is a truckload of money Yeah, sitting there. Mm -hmm. And they, they're, they're blind to the fact like they're not going to sign up for six months and all of your people are going to leave. That's the beauty of the business is the renewal income. That's why we all got into it. Yeah. Agents are in it, the renewal. So to be blind to the fact that whatever you pay them up front. And I'm not saying to overpay. I'm not encouraging that. But just to think that you can't afford somebody is absolutely crazy. Their statistic, before I even got on stage, was, okay, the agents that added staff, they increased their revenue. It was like 40 50%. It was crazy. And they were smaller agents, to be fair. And then these agents didn't add staff, and they lost 10%. And it's like, if that doesn't, tell you the story, you know, I don't know what else it is. And what I'm noticing the trend, and you would probably know too, is companies are now, they're doubling new business commission and they're cutting renewals. Like that's going to continue to do that. And all of the major companies uh, that I'm aware of are doing that. And so that puts the emphasis on the new business mm -hmm. and it gives you more opportunity to get your aid to pay that person and to get them started, but adding staff is, it's not, it's not expensive. It's really not. Yep. You're, you're going to make money. Yeah. Play the long game. Oh, for yeah. Sure. I, I love the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross twist yeah. on that instead of uh, always be closing, always be hiring. I think that's, <laughs> right. Yeah. I think that's great. No, it's so good. And what you just touched base on, that's actually something that me and her just had a conversation about like if we could go back and do one thing like differently it would have been what well, you're kind of saying like we did hire people from day one for sure with a team of three yeah. but we would have tried to find i don't better talent paid more money to yeah. where you have better talent that can produce more um versus just trying to get that entry level type of position in to come and help and so i um yeah. I love that. Like it, and it what was, you just said is it, it's spot on. We were reactive for a lot of it too. Yep. We yep. found ourselves in what you're talking about. And, and I love that you bring up 
the loss there of having to invest to find people quickly, but also the loss of commissions and premium because we don't have somebody selling. So there's a loss all the way around if you're not focused on always bringing new talent in. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, I think the other thing is holding on to somebody too long. Yep. You know, I mean, you're like, well, you know, they're selling 10, 15 policies a month and they're, they're it's, it's premium, you know, it's 10,000 in premium. It's like, but what are they losing? Yeah. So, you, you know, and too many times, you guys have heard it too. And you cut that person and sit without even hiring somebody, your sales go up. Yeah. How did that happen? Well, it's because they, they, they were losing sales because they weren't in the right fit, the right role for themselves. So they take the work of three, give it to two, the two people are better closer. You increase sales. Then they had a new third person who can sell Yep. And then they go up again from there. Addition so. by subtraction, baby. Like, <laughs> right. um, but not only that, like that person that you have a gut feeling about that you're just holding on to because, oh, they're killing your culture too. Um, there's no secret about it. Like it just, it's a, it's a cancer. Um, like, it, cause if it's okay for them to underperform, that means it's okay for everyone to underperform. Right. For so, sure. Kevin, for if uh, I love this, man, like you, this has been great. If somebody now, wanted now to. Now I want to take the test. <laughs> like, God. Send it to you. <laughs> Definitely do that. If somebody wanted to get in touch with you, find out more about ideal traits, how's the best way to go about doing that? And we'll put this in our show notes as well. Yeah, sure. So the main office number is 248 387 2717. But I'll do this, you know, for your listeners or anyone, I'm going to give you my cell phone because I truly, I mean, I love talking about insurance and helping people, you know, that whole zigzag, helping up people get what they want, you get what you want. Yeah. And so I'm going, to give it, I'm going to throw my cell phone out here. It's 248-379-3612. And it goes to people taking action, yeah. right? Yeah. Michael and Courtney, like people don't take action enough. It's like, I'm giving you my cell phone. If you want to talk to me about retention, we can talk about retention. Like it doesn't have to be about hiring. I'm not planning on, well, maybe I would try to sell you something only because I believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you know, you, when you have a passion for something, like it's That's like right. you have that duty, right. And responsibility to like, I have to tell you about it. Otherwise I'm not even being fair to you because I know I can improve your hiring process, but I'll talk to you about, you know, whatever you want to. Be glad, you know, and pick my brain. Let's go, and I'm sure I'll learn from them too. I love that. Do you have a what? You have a website? Yeah. So uh, www.idealtraits.com. I d e a l t r a i t s dot com. Okay. Well, Kevin, this is so good. I am like so invested. I love your website too, because it shows your team on a lake having a good time. So you can tell that you guys have fun and that's just going yeah. to seep out into your organization. So I'm, I'm super excited for everyone to use your cell phone and, and connect with you. If you see uh, Kansas City numbers texting you, you'll know it's us. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was talking to Kansas City today. Another Yay. Heck, yeah. heck yeah, yeah, man. So yeah. So thank you, Kevin. This has been great um, for all of those listening. Thank you so much for, for tuning in um, your support. We appreciate you. If you got a lot out of the episode today, make sure you give us a five-star review. Tell your peers about us. Other than that, as always, time is the most valuable and important asset that we all have. We appreciate you spending time with us. Kevin, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you both. Mm -hmm.